Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the study of God's Word. Over to Dr. Ronald. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another season of study and sharing and praying together. Thank you for the privilege to be able to be one family in Jesus. Thank you for your support, and thank you once again for how you have been obedient to the voice of God. Friends, what a blessing it is to know that we live in a time and that as Jesus describes in Matthew 24, that the love of many shall wax cold. That in a time of such heart coldness, God would like his people to represent the warmth of what it means to be in a familial experience, to be together as Christ's family, letting the world see the unity that exists only in Christ Jesus. I welcome you for today's study entitled To Them That Ask. To Them That Ask. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your invitation to be your people and to be a source of warmth to this sin-cold world. Thank you, Father, for your heart longing to see us become a people that truly manifest the power of God to save and redeem. Thank you for your steadfastness, your immovability. Thank you for your commitment and long-standing persistence to do in us what we in all our strength could not work together for ourselves. I thank you, Father, for my friends and my brothers and sisters and family who've joined us. Lord, they're coming from different experiences. Even today, some of them were assailed heavily by the enemy. And yet they have joined us today. And yet there are others who would still be making their way through, through whom would be tackled and disturbed and, and blocked by the enemy. And we thank you, Lord God, that you will tear down every enemy stronghold so that your people can be together to worship the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the appeals from your heart to ours, saying that you want to let the world see who God is in our lives. Help us, God, that we don't fail you in this desire. Help us that we don't fail you in your deep-seated love for us. Speak to us. Set us apart. Give us victory we need. Peace the world cannot give. Joy that only comes from Jesus. Thank you for what you have in store for us today. Speak to us and set us free, my Lord. We humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, friends, and thank you for joining us today in our study entitled To Them That Ask. To Them That Ask. Has anyone ever experienced the joy of, of running up to your parent and boldly asking? Boldly asking. Something happens to us as we age. Something happens to us as we age. Some call it maturity. And yet the reality is, friends, that it's not just about asking money. It's not just about asking things. Something happens to us with age that can rob us, that can separate us, that can remove us from that boldness, that boldness. Notice our passage for today that comes to us in Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. It came to pass that as he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, when he seized, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. One pastor highlights that Jesus was praying and the disciples would be watching him, but 
but there there was something he was doing and when 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 he stopped they were they were observing him they were observing him they were they were listening to him and 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 it's not that the disciples had never prayed in the past but the reality was that as they heard jesus pray as they heard how jesus opened his heart to his father it almost felt like they had never prayed there are times when at times when you when you hear someone share the gospel and and i'm so blessed you know to to have friends and 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 mentors who who are so gifted so deeply gifted and sometimes when i hear like wow how do they get all of that from one passage it almost seems like i'm you know retrospectively it seems like you never read that passage and although the reality is you've read it so many times it may seem like that you've never actually looked at the passage so it wasn't like the disciples had not prayed in the past but listening to jesus pray made it feel like we've never prayed so when he sees the bible says one of his disciples said unto him lord you've got to teach us how to pray we really need to learn we really need to learn lord how how it feels to pray like you how how can you how can you open your heart to the father in the way you do we we need to learn we need to learn how to pray in the manner that you pray and brothers and sisters it would do us well it would do us well if we brought the same plea to our heavenly father all of us are familiar with presenting a grocery list to the lord often times did i did i did i speak to someone we're all familiar with presenting a grocery list to the lord lord this is what i want and this is what i want and this is what i want and get me this and get me this and get me this we're very familiar with 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 presenting our demands but what does it mean to really pray one other puts it beautifully that prayer is the breath of the soul if prayer is the breath of the soul i ask you today how many of you are truly alive if prayer is the breath of the soul just how many people do we have today who are on ventilators if prayer is really the breath of the soul is there anybody here who's truly breathing it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place when he seized one of his disciples said unto him lord teach us to pray as john also taught his disciples lord teach us to pray as john also taught his disciples the bible says in verse 2 he said unto them when you pray Jesus says unto them when you pray say our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done as in heaven so in earth Jesus astounds them first off as he begins his prayer by saying our father You see friends when you look in the Old Testament the name of God can't even be pronounced it's written Y H W H different alphabets were supplied later on to make it sound Yahweh but the name originally was Y H W H how do you spell that name you couldn't even take that name people would bow people would be stunned people would be silent he's the god on the mountain the thunders the clouds the lightnings he is that thunderous image that's who god is but to all of a sudden even to the shock of the disciples to hear wait father father our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name so so the first thing that shook them and took them aback was number 1 to hear wait you call him father 
And yes, I know you know this so well, and I know you, you've probably heard sermons and you've preached this. My question is, when you do come into prayer, do you realize you're talking to a father and not to some high exalted figure on a throne? While he is high, while he is exalted, while he is on his, on his throne, the reality is he is all of that, but also your father. I remember many years ago, as dad recounts the event, me coming with boldness, me, me coming with, with, with that audacity, coming in from, coming in from morning assembly at, at school during devotion time. And, and after devotion was over, I came running. And as I was running, I, trying to catch my breath, grabbed a bottle out of the, out of the fridge. And as I was drinking that water, I, I gasped for some air in between uh, just to tell him I prayed today. Just to tell him I prayed today in school. You know, I guess they asked me to pray. I think, I think it was that. And and just did that. And then I went back to drinking and I'm gasping for breath, but, you know, thirsty also, but was saying to dad also, they asked me to pray today. I prayed today. Just, just wanted to tell him that. Over the years, I remember driving with him and, 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 and he, he just, he just loves driving. And, and over the years, I remember driving with him and sitting next to him and, and, and just wanting to say something, even, even if it was and it was bad, even if I had to make something up, I'll just make something up just to, you know, bring across something, just to try to, to like, to just show him that I know so much, just, just trying to say something, just trying to, trying to speak to him. And I do it with friends, I do it with friends. It was, Yes, grow, growing up, even making up stuff, even if it wasn't true, I would just just make up stuff, you know, just to just to I don't know, even either to appear smart before friends or 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 to get friends' attention, just just wanted to just wanted to speak. Our Father. The Bible says. Jesus wanted the disciples to understand when you come in prayer, you need to come with the realization, with the understanding, with the appreciation. You're not just talking to God on his throne. You're speaking to a father. A father who longs to hear you. A father who yearns to hear your heart connect with his. The longings of a father. Oh, the longings of a father. I remember that day. As I came back, drank that water, said that to dad and ran away. I guess one of the reasons why it stuck with me, I don't think it would have stuck with me otherwise. I think one of the reasons that that incident stuck with me is because dad mentioned it. He mentioned it when he was sharing. And my son wanted to tell me this. He wanted, he was excited about letting me know that he prayed. Now, friends, do you, can you perhaps see Jesus? I'd, I'd like you to, I'd like, I'd like you to in, in your imagination to get, are there times when, when Jesus goes around the courts of heaven, stopping one angel or the other, just to let them know, do you know what happened today? Ronald spoke to me. Ah. <laughs> uh. Is it possible that at some angelic gathering, Jesus brings up the subject, oh, uh, friends, by the way, by the way, Ronald talked to me today. Oh, he was nice to hear him. He was excited to tell me something. You know, you know, he's always excited to speak to his friends, but today I sensed an excitement in his voice as he was longing to speak to me. Do you think God gets that feeling as my dad got many years ago? Seeing that I was just excited to tell him this. I was just excited to tell him this. Our Father, which art in heaven. Friends, is the flip side also probably true? That there are times when in the angelic assembly, Jesus has to declare, it's been a month. He hasn't spoken to me. Dear sister, is it possible that Jesus has to declare to the angels, 
We need to do something. She's not spoken to me in, in, in two weeks. But I guess, but, but Lord, how can you say that? I, I, I just prayed this morning. No, I, I heard you say something. <laughs> Listen to me carefully, friend. I heard you say something, but I didn't hear you pray. Do you realize why the disciples were saying, Master, you've got to teach us how to pray? And then and, and Jesus could have said, but wait, are you telling me you've never prayed in the past? No, but Jesus understood what they meant. Jesus understood. Jesus understood what they meant. Jesus understood that, yes, they, they had been saying things, and yes, they were very sincere. But the way they've seen me open myself to the Father, that's what they need. That's what they're looking for. That's what they want. That's what they want. And they're seeking, they're, they're, beginning, they're beginning to ask the right questions. They're, they're, beginning, to, they're beginning to make the, make the better requests. They're beginning to make the better requests. Lord, teach us how to pray. Lord, teach us how to pray. You, you see, friends, just, 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 just pause. Pause with me and listen to, listen to what the Bible says. Lord, teach us how to pray. You know, we, we've, been, we, we've been in an experience. I mean, we did it this morning. We, we did put some words together, and, 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 and I thought that that's prayer. But after hearing you, Jesus, it seems like what we did was was not at all what you had in mind, was, is, is not at all what you desire, is not at all what, what you have in mind when, when, you, when you talk about praying. Lord, we need this experience. We, we need the experience of what it means to pray. See, one of the things, friends, that, that, that the, the reason why that, that stands out is because the word prayer the word prayer in the Greek is also translated as worship. It is translated as worship. It's, it's, and friends, pause with me, pause with me there and, and reflect with me for a moment. Uh, when, when, when you did what you, what you declare as prayer, when you did that act this morning, could you get up from your knees or from your bed and be able to say, I worshiped him? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. After that quick read and that, and, that, and that few seconds or a minute in prayer, and then you, as you got up to, to go off to your daily work, could you look back, could you look back at this morning and be able to say, I really worshiped? That's prayer. That's prayer. Lord, teach us how to worship. We're, we're, able to, we're able to devise some sentences together. We're, we're able to conjure some, some vocabulary to be able to sound nice and to sound aesthetic and to be able to sound very eloquent and very pleasing to the ears and very appealing to the mindset. The prayers are very intellectual. The, the vocabulary can almost sort of flow someone away in that articulate thought, but, but that's not what prayer is, Lord. Listening to you has just made us realize that's not what prayer is. Prayer is not an oratory pulpit. Prayer is not, uh, prayer is not the checking. Prayer is not uh, the appreciation of, of vocabulary skills. Prayer is not the correction table of a grammar teacher checking just how good you are in your punctuations. Just how good you are in enunciating, in, in articulating, in, in, in putting together, in pronouncing, in declaring. Uh, God's not interested in that. What God's really interested is in you lifting up your heart in worship. Did you pray? Did you really pray this morning? Did you take time, brother, today to pause and pray, to pause and worship? Lord, you've got to teach us how to pray. Lord, you, you've just, you just have to teach us how to pray. I don't know what we were doing, but whatever we were doing, it wasn't this. It wasn't this at all. We need to know how to pray. Pray. 
beautiful. Notice what the Bible says, friends, in James chapter 4. Hmm. Hmm. James chapter 4, James chapter 4. The Bible says in verse 3, Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. Now I, now, now I heard you say something today. I heard you say something today, but, but, but what you were asking for was, was for yourself. It was going to be spent on you. It was going to be spent on you. You ask, see that 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 that's why it's not just it's not just about saying oh yes to them that ask no 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 uh, you ask amiss. That's because see you don't you don't get what prayer is about. You're still making prayer about yourself. Prayer is not about yourself. You see, he's trying to shatter that mold as he explains in verse two. This is how you pray, our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. The number one thing Jesus is trying to teach you and me, that prayer is not about you, it's about God. Oh, I don't know if that got through, I'm going to say that again. The number one thing God is trying to teach us through prayer is that prayer is not about you, it's about God. It's not shopping, friends. If all you do in prayer is ask, 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 if that's all you do, that's called shopping. That's not called praying. You go to the supermarket and you ask this and you ask that and you ask that. Somebody says, but wait, Jesus said, ask and it shall be given to you. You're right. You're right. Asking has its place. But prayer is not, prayer is not synonymous with asking, friends. Our subject for today to them that ask. When you pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be his name, his kingdom come, his will be done. As it is done in heaven, so it is, it should be done in earth. It is all about him. It is all about him. It's not about you. Stop making prayer about yourself is the plea of Jesus. That is the plea of Jesus. Stop making prayer always about yourself. It isn't about you. Stop making it about you. When you pray. Mm, wait, 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 friends. Oh, brethren, we could be here a long time. Come with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 2. Listen to what the Bible says. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, friends, this is beautiful. Ecclesiastes 5, we're talking about when you pray. Listen to this. When you pray, Let's, 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 let's use that as a, let's use that as an opening statement. When you pray, read Ecclesiastes 5.2. When you pray, be not rash with thy mouth. Let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. Did you, did you listen to, did you listen to what the wise man is saying? When you pray, be not rash. When you pray, do not let your heart be hasty. All right, I've asked this, I've asked this, I've asked this. Don't be hasty. Take time. Worship. Worship cannot be done in haste. Worship needs time. When you open your heart to someone, you don't open your heart to someone in seconds. You open your heart. Opening your heart takes time. Open heart surgeries take time. They take time. When you pray, Ecclesiastes 5.2, be not rash, be not hasty. Oh, wow. wow. In Hosea chapter 14 and verse 2, when you pray, listen to this, listen to this. Wow. When you pray, Hosea 14 and verse 2, what do you do? When you pray, Hosea 14, 2 says, take with you words and turn to the Lord. Wow. When you pray, take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, say unto him, say unto him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that is beautiful. Oh, that is beautiful. 
When you pray, Hosea 14, 2, take with you words. Turn to the Lord and say, Lord, take away my iniquity. Receive me graciously and I will render the calves of our lips. I will render the sacrifice of my lips. When you pray, do not be hasty. When you pray, ask the Lord to take away your iniquity and offer your lips as a sacrifice to the Lord. Offer them up to the Lord so that whenever they open, they open only to God's glory, not yours. Oh, this is powerful. Powerful. When you pray, Matthew 6, verse 7, listen to this. When you pray, Matthew 6, verse 7. When you pray, Matthew 6, verse 7. Use not vain repetitions. As the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Don't, don't, don't use repetition. Don't, don't just keep saying the same thing over and over again. I, I'm not here. I'm not impressed by how many times you can take my name on your lips. I, I, I'm not here to hear you say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'm not here to hear you say my name again and again. I'm here to hold conversation with you. We're speaking. We're, we're talking. So don't come with a script. Don't try to impress me with your vocabulary skills. Open your heart to me. When you pray, stop using vain repetitions. That's what the heathen do. For they think in their much speaking, they will be heard. They think if they take the name of Jesus 10,000 times, they will be heard. Sorry. Sorry, this is, not a, this is not a Guinness Book of World Records. No. This is a father who longs to hear you. All right, I heard that you know my name. Now tell me more. Tell me more. Hmm. He continues to say in Matthew 6, 8, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things you have need of, even before you ask him. Our subject for today, to them that ask, to them that ask. Our Father, when you pray, oh, listen to this. When you pray, say, Our Father. Wait, wait. When you say, say, Our Father. Brothers and sisters, I really hope you're listening. When you pray, say, Our Father. No, 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 not the father of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Israel. Yes, yes, he was their father also, but is he your father? That's the question. Yes, he's the God of the Bible. Yes, he's the God of the, the great patriarchs and prophets. But the question is, has he become your father? Has he come in that communion relationship with you? Has you have you grown in a knowing relationship with your father? Can you really call him my father, our father? Or is he still Abraham's father to you? Is he still Jacob's father to you? Is he still the father in the Bible or is he the father of your life? When you pray, don't be hasty. You see, hasty prayers will never let you make him your father. When you pray, learn to be silent in his presence. When you pray, learn to open your heart to him. When you pray, ask him, take words to him. Ask him to remove iniquity. Ask him to remove iniquity. Offer him the sacrifice of your lips. When you pray, say, Our Father. Say, Our Father. Notice what it goes on to say. Our Father which art in heaven. Our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Hmm. Wow. Leviticus 10 verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. Leviticus 10 verse 3. The Bible says, Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. When you pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Let God be sanctified. And friends, notice what the Bible says in Leviticus 10, 3, that God is sanctified through them that come near me. Listen to me carefully, friends. When you don't know what it means to pray, when you're always hasting away in prayer, one, you don't know him as father, and he who has not come close to him, the Bible says in Leviticus 10, 3, I can be hallowed, I can be sanctified only through them who are near me. If you're not close to me, if you're not in a relationship with me, you won't be able to present me as the sanctified one before the world. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Powerful. Notice what he goes on to say. He says, thy, thy, thy kingdom come. Oh, thy kingdom come. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Daniel speaks about it. Daniel speaks about it in Daniel 2 and verse 44. He speaks about it. He says in Daniel 2, 44, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It shall stand forever. It shall stand forever. Thy kingdom come, that everlasting kingdom. Let it come, my Lord. Lord, let that kingdom come. Thy will be done. Let thy will be done. Let thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Now, friends, the reality is God's will is done perfectly in heaven. Do you realize that the prayer, that prayer, listen, listen, listen. Prayer is about not hasting. Prayer is about coming close to God. Prayer is about understanding he's my father. Prayer is about understanding that he is the hallowed one, the sanctified one. Prayer is about, pre prayer is about preparation for the kingdom of the one who is hallowed. Friends, all of this is all connected. These are not random separate statements about some God who is holy. These are statements that are making a point. If you haste, if you haste, you won't know him as your father. If you don't know him as your father, you can't hallow his name. If, if you don't know him as father, if you've not hallowed his name, you're not ready for his kingdom to come. And friends, the thing is that when his kingdom comes, his perfect will is going to be done in his kingdom. But if you're always in a haste and don't know him as your personal father and don't know what it means to hallow his name, then you don't know his perfect will. Then you don't know his perfect will. Oh, no wonder the disciples said, Lord, you have to teach us. Lord, you really have to teach us how to pray. We really need to learn how to pray, Lord. Notice, notice what the psalmist says about his will in Psalm 103, verse 20. Notice how the psalmist describes, how he describes the, 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 the sayings of the Lord and the perfect will of the Lord. Psalm 103, verse 20, the Bible says, Bless the Lord, ye his angels. Notice, notice, bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Notice what the Bible says, bless the Lord, ye his angels, the angels excel in strength and right next to strength are followed with the words that do his commandments, that obey, that hearken unto the voice of his word. Friends, the Bible, I believe, is saying to me that angels excel in strength because they do what God says. They do his perfect will. Wait, wait, wait. Friends, many of us are confused. Many of us don't know what to do. Many of us don't know how to take the next step. Many of us don't know how is this all going to be sorted out. Many of us are confused. The young people are confused, don't know what career paths to take, don't know what courses to choose as they get to college. As they get out of college, they don't know where to work, how to work. They don't have an understanding of the perfect will of the Lord. That's because we've lived our lives in such haste. 
We've never known him as our father. Hence, we don't know what it means to hallow his name. We're not ready for his kingdom because his kingdom is a perfect kingdom where his perfect will comes to pass. And the thing is, we don't know God's perfect will and we could care less. Oftentimes, we could care less about the perfect will of God as long as there is food on my table and clothing on my back, electricity in my home and air conditioning running in the house, I'm okay. Who cares about God's perfect will? Perhaps that's the reason why we never ask Jesus, Lord, you've got to teach us how to pray. You've got to teach us how to pray. The Bible says in verse 3, Jesus continues. He says, when you pray, Say, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day, give us day by day our daily bread. Mm. Mm. The wise man had understanding of this. In Proverbs 30 and verse 8, listen to what he says. Proverbs 30 and verse 8, uh, the, the, the wise man says, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Lord, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Oh, that's deep. Lord, give us day by day our daily bread. No, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, when you pray, when you pray, don't, don't, don't pray to the Lord to hoard for the next 11 months. When you pray, don't pray, Lord, keep my fridge stacked to the max that the doors don't even close while there are poor in the street who have nothing to eat. Lord, please give me, as the wise man says, food that is convenient for me. Food that wouldn't make me sick. Lord, don't give me the abundance that I plague myself with sickness. Speaking to a friend the other day, and I realized every time I speak to my friend and I ask, you know, what's for lunch? You know, I like asking my friends what they've eaten. And as I asked one of my friends, so, so what's for lunch? What's for breakfast? Well, almost all the time, friends, almost all the time, I think, or perhaps all the time that I've asked, I've always heard the most simplest things come out of my friend's mouth. And I've wondered, and I told my friend, I said, you know, you all eat so healthy. And my friend responded back saying, brother, maybe that's because we're so poor. Maybe that's because we're so poor. We're, we're cooking nothing fancy because this is all we could afford. Isn't that a blessing? Isn't that a blessing? Give us day by day our daily bread. Wait a minute, friends. While all of us know, while this also, yes, this is speaking about our physical food, doesn't God also give us day by day a word to dwell upon? Doesn't God give us day by day a faithful word from Scripture? Doesn't God allow us to feed off of this bread? And notice, friends, just as much as he requires you to share your bread with others, how can we feed of the riches of the Lord and still keep it to ourselves? How can we feed of the richness of the Lord and still expect to keep this to ourselves and not want to share it with anybody else? Give us this day our daily bread. Luke 11, 4, the Bible says, and forgive us our sins, for we also, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. Wait a minute. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. I had a family member who I guess for quite some time would not like to say, would not like to say these words, forgive us our sins. 
as we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And then somebody, or the, another family member confronted him and said, so w why don't you say this? And I think his response was because I'm not doing it. I think it was something to that effect. I guess they had to sit together and, 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 and share together that, that that's the purpose of this prayer. Listen to me, friends. Forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. But I'm not doing that. In Matthew 6, Jesus puts it beautifully. When you read, when you read, the, when you read the same passage, in a parallel passage in, in Matthew 6, uh, when the Bible says, and, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You could read about that in Matthew 6, 12. And someone points out, Pastor Henry Wright, in fact, points out that, that, do you realize, that do you realize how deep those words are? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do, do you know what that word as means? <laughs> The word as is, is referring to the manner. Lord, forgive us our debts as we, the way we, in the manner we forgive our debtors. Do, do you know what you're actually praying? Do you know what you're actually saying to the Lord? Lord, forgive us our sins in the manner I forgive the debts of others. Now, friends, you perhaps know too well, you can go to someone and say, can you please forgive me? And perhaps somebody can say to you, Lord, can you please forgive me for the wrong I've done to you? And you say, oh, yes, 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 I forgive you, but I don't want to see your face again. Ah, somebody knows how that feels. Oh, yes, I forgive you. Yeah, yeah, but don't show me your face again. Now get out of my face. Do you know what we're saying? Lord, Lord, um, um, I, I forgave that person, but I also told that person that I don't want to see their face again. And now as I come to you asking for the forgiveness of my sins, what I'm saying is, Lord, forgive me, but never desire to see my face again. Do you know that you'd perish if God had to do that? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll forgive them, Lord, but, but don't ask me to ever shake hands with them and be nice to them and, you know, sit next to them in church. I mean, yeah, I'll forgive them, but, but never, never am I going to speak to them again. All right, so when we come into prayer, we're saying, Father, forgive us the, in the manner in which we've forgiven that individual. We've said we'll forgive you, but we don't want to see your face again. We don't want to talk to you ever again, never shake hands with you, never sit with you in church. We don't want any of that. Forgive us our sins, Lord, also the same way. Forgive us our sins in the same way. Have you perhaps also gone to someone, forgive us as we forgive our debtors, you know, as also refers to time. Has, has someone ever gone to, has someone ever gone to someone and, and, and asked for forgiveness or perhaps somebody came to you and said, can you please forgive me for what I've done? And you are so angry. You're saying, you know what? Come back after one week. I can't even think straight right now. Just, just leave me alone because I'm just very, very upset. Just, just walk away. Come back after one week. Okay, okay. So you're withholding your forgiveness for one week from this person. And yet you have the audacity to come into prayer that day before you sleep and say, Lord, please forgive me for the sins I've done today. But what you've, what you've said really to God is, Lord, forgive me my sins in the same manner of time, in the same amount of time that I will take to forgive the sin of my brother. And I've said to him, come back after one week, and then I will think about whether I will forgive your sins or not. Do you know what's going to happen to you if God takes one week to forgive your sin? Do you realize there's a reason why the Lord is saying, I am faithful and just to forgive you? Because he knows if I don't forgive you, your sin is upon you and you perish. You perish. You perish. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Oh, brothers and sisters, I hope we realize what we're saying when we pray. There is a reason why the disciples said, teach us how to pray. 
Jesus continues in Luke 11 and says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil, Lord. And then you're expecting Jesus to say something next. When all of a sudden you hear him say, and he said to them, which of you shall have a friend? Wait, wait, what? Jesus, where's the rest of the prayer? You said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, thy power and thy glory forever and ever. Amen. Where's that? Forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. I'm trying to replay it in my mind now, Lord. And, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And I've memorized this since I was a child, Lord. And, and the next thing that's supposed to come is, you know, Jesus, what's supposed to come next? For thine is the kingdom, Jesus. Where, where, where did that portion go? For thine is the kingdom, thy power, thy glory forever and ever. Amen. Where, where's that bit? Where did that go? Where did that go? For thine is the kingdom, the power and thy glory forever. Where did that bit go? Do you realize Jesus not finished his prayer when he transitions into Luke 11 verse 5 and you want to listen. He interjects this story for a purpose. He's not done. He's not done. He stopped somewhere in between to make this point. And he says to them, he says, which of you shall have a friend? Notice the question is, teach us how to pray. On the subject of prayer, Jesus is trying to teach them something very important. Which of you shall have a friend shall go to him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. This, yes, is very powerful. And for those of you who understand prophecy and prophetic events and end time events that are to come before us, you'll find this stunningly powerful. Luke 11 verse 5 says, he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. Listen carefully now. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Notice, notice in the Bible, friends, on the context of prayer, Jesus says there is a friend goes to his friend at midnight and he's asking for his friend what? Three loaves. He's asking for bread. What is bread? Icons bread to his word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Listen very carefully, friends. In the context of prayer, Jesus interjects this very potent story. He says, which of you shall have a friend? You will go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me bread. And this bread is not for himself. This bread is for a friend who's come in his journey, who, who a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. He's not asking bread for himself. He's asking bread for someone who has come out there. Friends, do you realize that when we read in Matthew 25, this is powerful. And in, in, in Matthew 25, we hear about the 10 virgins. And when we hear about the 10 virgins, we hear this powerful truth that comes to us in Matthew 25, verse 6. See, the, the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept, verse 5 says, and at midnight there was a cry made saying, what? The behold, the bridegroom cometh. There was a cry made at midnight. At midnight there was a cry made. You would call it a midnight cry. Prophecy students are, are, are wearing their prophetic eyeglasses to, to, to now take a fresh look at Luke 11 now. So wait, at midnight, this friend goes out and he is seeking bread. He's, 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 he's going out seeking bread and he wants to give bread, not to himself. He is looking for bread for a friend who doesn't have bread. Listen to me carefully. Just like this, brothers and sisters, at the end of time, we are going to have a people who will go out to the Lord who will go out in the midnight cry to give bread and the bread will not be for themselves. The bread will be for those who never tasted of this bread. For we are told that in that midnight cry, in that loud cry, in that in that cry made by the angel of Revelation 18, which Brother John would have mentioned to you, is the, is the angel that represents God's church that is to lighten the world with the character of God, 
with the glory of God. It is a going to be a time when God's people will be going out to give bread to those who have never heard. Wait a minute, I thought he was just teaching about prayer. What is he doing putting this prophetic event in the midst of this prayer that I thought was just so simple? Jesus is doing something powerful here. He is trying to make a powerful point. He is saying there's a friend that comes at midnight, and at midnight he asks. He's, at, he's looking for bread. It's for somebody who's out there. I have nothing to set before him. Verse 7, he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not, listen to me carefully. He from within shall answer and say, trouble me not, the door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. Brothers and sisters, are you paying attention? Are you paying attention? Prophecy students know there was a time in the past when in a way the door was shut as Jesus moved from his priestly ministry from the holy place to the most holy place. The door was shut. And notice again, you hear from inside, trouble me not, the door is now shut. And guess what? My children are with me. Those who followed Jesus into his ministry, into the most holy place. They are the children who are with him. The door is shut. Oh, this is deep. Oh, this is deep, friends. This is deep. While Jesus is picking up a story, speaking about something, he's also speaking about a time that is coming that will come to a people that will come to a people who have been hasty in prayer. This is deep. This is deep. He's also speaking about a people who have not spent time with the Lord, who have been hasty, who have played around with spiritual exercises, who've gone about trifling with the experience of worship. This will be their ordeal. This will be their ordeal while God's children will be safe with him. Now, coming back, coming away from this prophetic implication, coming back to the story, uh, in the story, we hear that Jesus says, Jesus, Jesus says, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. He will rise and give him as many as he needs because he's not asking for himself. He's asking for somebody who doesn't have, for somebody who's never heard. But you know, friends, what the, the, the thing that really gets to me about this passage is the word used in Luke 11, 8. I'd heard in the past, oh, when Jesus says, he would not give him, but because of his importunity, I'd heard in the past that that word importunity meant persistence, that because he's persistent, that's why Jesus, the, the man within will say, okay, I will give it to you. All right, I'll, 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 I will give it to you. I will give it to you because of his importunity, because of his importunity. But when you really look at that word, when you really, really look at that word importunity, it comes, it's a very interesting word. Very, very interesting word. The, the word is the word the word is translated as 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 impudent the, the the quality of the quality of being impudent hmm very interesting to be impertinent to be immodest to 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 uh, to lack shame in other words not ashamed To lack shame, uh, the word in the Greek also means to, 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 lack, to, to lack shame facedness. Wait, what? Though he would not give him yet because of his lack of shame. In other words, because of his shamelessness, because of his audacity to ask. And wait, his plea is not for himself. His plea is to be able to feed somebody else out there who's never had who does not have. Yet because of his 
unashamedness, yet because of his lack of shame in asking for somebody else who is in need, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Now, friends, now you better understand these words in the context of what Jesus has said in the prayer thus far. He says, you see, disciples, prayer is not about a set of words. I can, I can share with you about prayer, but, but, but like some people, they will think that just repeating this prayer that I've just given, just repeating and repeating and repeating it 10 times and 50 times and 100 times is what pleases me. No, I'm wanting to listen to your heart. I've given you a pattern. I've taught you what prayer is. But, but within the aspect of prayer, I can teach you what prayer is. And yet the challenge is, here's the thing, yet the challenge is I can tell you what prayer is. And yet there will be many of you who will go away from prayer thinking if I just say these words, it's all going to work. The thing is, it's not a magic spell. It's not a magic spell that you say these words 1000 times and it, it, everything, you know, sorts out. It doesn't work like that. I'm here to teach you that as you open your heart to God, you are to open it persistently, unashamedly, lacking that shamefacedness. I want to be careful. As Jesus is saying that, he's not saying that you are to be irreverent. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, don't hold anything back. As a little child coming and, and just, just, just hungering to tell my father that I prayed today, do you, do you have that lack, that excitement, that passion, that energy to tell Tell your father what's really happening. To open your heart and pour out your heart like water before him. Jesus is trying to teach his disciples that prayer is not just a collection of words. Prayer is persistence. Will you persist in the rough times, in the odd times, when it seems that the door is closed? Will you persist in asking, knowing, believing that prayer is not about you, it's about God? And connecting the one who has the bread to somebody who has never tasted of the bread. Is somebody paying attention to this? Prayer is about knocking the door of the one who is the bread maker, who is the bread, and presenting it to someone who hasn't tasted the, the beauty of that bread. And in that midnight hour, in that midnight cry hour, friends, we need to have the bread to be able to give to those who do not have. Luke 11, verse 10, for everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. You see, he changes that he spins around what, what he's trying to say. He says, now you understand. Now I want to tell you, after I've told you about prayer and connected it with the persistence by giving in that story, now I can tell you, ask and it will be given, but ask persistently. Seek and seek persistently and you'll find. Knock and keep on knocking and it will be open. Don't ask and leave. Don't seek and leave. Don't knock and leave. Ask continually. Seek continually. Knock continually. And you shall receive rich treasures. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, how many of you will give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? If he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? If you know if you know how to give good gifts unto your children, even though you're you being evil, even though being evil, you know how to give good gifts, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now pause and listen carefully. He's saying, you being evil, know how to give good gifts. If you know how to give good gifts, will not your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? Notice what he's calling the Holy Spirit. He's calling the Holy Spirit a gift, a good gift. I would say the greatest gift, a gift that even God himself cannot give you a gift greater than the Holy Spirit. As one author puts it beautifully, God himself cannot give you a greater gift than the Holy Spirit. But notice what he says. What he's saying is that in your asking, seeking, knocking, 
I hope your persistence is not just towards asking for yourself. Lord, I need a big car. I need a big car. I need a big car. And I need a bigger house. And I need a bigger house. I hope you understand what you're asking. And again, if you are not near me, you will not understand my perfect will. You will not be able to pray in accordance with my will. To my glory, you will seek your own glory. And the reality is, if your heart is in the right place, above everything you ask, you will ask for the Holy Spirit. For when the Holy Spirit comes, he will bring every other blessing in his train. Listen to me carefully now. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will bring every other blessing in his train. You can either go for all the blessings or you can go for the Holy Spirit who brings all the other blessings. Now that doesn't mean I should, I should pray and ask for the Holy Spirit so that I can get everything else. Again, if you draw nearer to me, I will change your desires. I will change your heart. I will change your name. How much more shall you, Heavenly Father, give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Here's the thing. If you don't get this, notice what happens right next. He was casting out a devil. He was dumb. It came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake and the people wondered. But some of them said he casted out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. Did you listen to that? Jesus just made a point about the Holy Spirit. There's some people who have never cared to ask for the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus casts out the devils, which he declared he had received an anointing to preach the gospel, to set the captives free, when he had received the anointing of the Holy Spirit to do this, he was casting out a devil in the power of the Holy Spirit, setting him free, setting this captive free. And there were those who were saying he is doing this in the power of the devil. Friends, the danger is if above everything, you are not sincerely seeking to be filled with the Spirit of God. The workings of God will look to you like the workings of devils. There is a danger. The Pharisees made the same mistake. They committed the same crime. They looked at Jesus and judged the works of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, as the chief works of the devil. Brothers and sisters, Jesus says, I need you to be filled or else you are going to fall. You're either filled or you're fallen. And the Lord says, I need you to understand how the end will be. I need you to be a people taking the word out. I need you to be a people who are so filled with the Spirit, who go out in that midnight cry, in that loud cry, taking the message of the Lord to the world. But that's not going to ever happen if all you do is haste, haste, haste in prayer. For I declare to you, for I declare to you, I will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. And the rock gave us water. Friends, learn to speak to your rock, Christ Jesus. He is longing to fill you with his Holy Spirit. To them that ask. my holy name I will give it that I will give it I will give it for my glory and for your great good 
Dear brothers and sisters, I hope the message is an appeal for you to seek the Lord, for you to see God persistently, to ask and, and to ask and plead for the Holy Spirit. That is who you need above everything else. Let us stop trying to use God. Let us learn what it means to love God. Let us learn to come to him for him and not come to him for things. Let us learn to come to him for himself and ask of him God. You see, the Holy Spirit is the third I will give you the whole story. I will be. I'd like to seek your face and I want to be that individual. Lightened with your glory, your character, filled with your spirit. Preparing the world for the coming of Jesus. If that's you, friend, kneel with me, please, as we pray. Kneel with me, please, as we pray. And I, I pray that it would be the prayer of your heart. That when we come to God in prayer, we would really, really open ourselves to him and allow him to allow his perfect will to be declared and to be fulfilled in our lives. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again. Thank you again, Father, for your word. Thank you for the peace, the healing, the renewal of life, the strength, the light we receive every time we come to your word. Father, you never let us go empty when we come into your presence. Thank you so much. I thank you, Lord, for allowing us to look at this precious passage today. The warning, the responsibility, and the great gift that is revealed to us in this short passage. The responsibility of taking the gospel and God's character to the world. The warning that is sent to us that if we're not filled with your spirit, we will not understand the works of the spirit. We will judge them as the works of the devil. But at the same time, we're also being taught that we need to learn to get close to you. That we need to know what it means to pray, not to put together hasty words, but to place ourselves wholly at your feet. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for these blessings. Bless my brothers and sisters. Give them peace. Give them love. Give them your almighty presence. May they rejoice in you and live for you forevermore. Thank you, Father. Thank you for all of these choicest blessings. We thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen.